Hi there, it's Megan Mitchell, the founder of Agents of Change Social Work Test Prep. And today I'm here to bring you a revamped, updated social work shorts on a preview of some ASWB sample practice questions. If you are looking for more ASWB exam prep content, go ahead and head on over to our website at agentsofchangeprep.com. We really do have something for everyone from free to paid content, and we have tons of information for you to get more acclimated to be prepared to sit for your ASWB exam. So let's go ahead and jump into some tips for approaching practice questions. So practice questions, why are they so important? Content is great for this exam. You need to know content to be able to answer the questions correctly. However, Completing practice questions is just as important, and I would make the case that it might be more important than just studying the content. And why is that? It's going to give you practice. Practice, 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 practice. And for this exam, content is not enough to help you get a passing score. Not only do you need to know the content, you need to be able to apply the content, and you need to be able to utilize it in practice questions, in clinical vignettes, to help you piece together the information. So it's very important that throughout your studying you are completing practice questions. I 100% recommend completing at least one full length practice exam so that you are comfortable with the way the questions are worded, you're comfortable sitting for the entirety of the four hours, and so that on test day you have some practice under your belt. So let's say practice practice, 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 practice questions are going to be really helpful. I also want to preface it by saying, if you are taking practice exams or you're working through practice questions, a solid, good quality practice question is going to have a rationale as to why the question is correct or incorrect. If you are finding questions that do not give answer rationales, it's not a good question. You need to know why the answer was correct and you need to be able to use that rationale to help guide you. So you really need to make sure that you are finding quality, solid practice questions to work from. Here is my advice as you are working through practice questions. Read each question two times through. And you might be thinking, I don't have time. There's 170 questions. I don't have time to read each question through twice. Why do I suggest this? Because you're going to pick up on details that you missed the first read through. When we are in the testing environment, it's very high stakes. We might be more anxious, our adrenaline might be, you know, operating at a high level. So we might be more prone to rush. So if you read each question twice, you're able to do a sweep a second time to make sure you did not miss anything in the first read through. If you are someone that tends to rush or go fast through tests, um, so say you're someone that's finishing in an hour, an hour and a half, that's pretty quick. Slow down. Read each question two times through. See if you missed any details at first glance. And a lot of times I will have people get answers wrong. They go back, they reread it, and they say, oh, I missed that. I, I just was going too fast, and I missed a very important detail. Always ask yourself after reading the question, what is this question asking? If you're not able to understand what the question's asking, you need to go through and read it so that you do understand. And some of these questions can be longer, they can be dense, they can be confusing. This is where you really want to rely on some sort of breaking down question strategy. So here I suggest using the five W's approach that is an agents of change approach that we teach. And if you are looking for information on the five W's, we have a blog post, a podcast, and a YouTube video on it. So make sure you have some sort of strategy for pulling out important details and being able to synthesize information as you're reading practice questions. Lastly, read all answer choices before selecting an answer. This is also a good tip if you're someone that tends to rush. So you don't want to automatically say, I know the answer is A, I'm going to select A and move on. Every word matters on this test, and there could be the slightest variation in answer choices. So you want to make sure that you're reading all answer choices before selecting an answer and thinking about all of the answer choices. Similarly to how you 
pull out information in the practice question stem. And the stem is just the, the wording that is, is giving you to answer the, the practice question. You wanna make sure that you're equally spending your effort reading the answer choices before jumping to a conclusion, selecting an answer and moving on. Also, do not leave any answers un and any answers unanswered. You will get it wrong if you leave questions blank. So if you are stuck, make your best guess, but please select an answer because even selecting your best guess is better than leaving it blank. So make sure that you are not leaving any questions blank because those are gonna be points that you get off. So let's go ahead and do three practice questions together here. Okay. Number seven, a new policy is being proposed in a town that could significantly reduce access to mental health services for low income populations. As part of the policy making process, there is an opportunity for public comment. In line with the NASW code of ethics, what actions should a, should a social worker take to address this issue? A, remain neutral and avoid taking any stance on the policy. B, facilitate informed participation by the public, specifically those affected in shaping the policy, or C, limit involvement to discussing the policy changes only with professional social work circles. What are you choosing and why? And if you can remember, where does this come up in the code of ethics? How does this, um, what ethical principle does this discuss? Give you a few more moments and then we will go ahead and start eliminating. This is a three answer choice. You have A, B, and C choices here. Okay. And this there is, if, if you are getting close to test date, make sure you definitely read the code of ethics. There's so many little subsections and whatnot. Um, and we do have to promote social justice. We are expected to do advocacy work if it is going to improve the lives of our clients. So you definitely, people, I know it, it can be uncomfortable sometimes. You don't want to take a stance either way, but it's in the code of ethics that we should be advocating for services, policies that are going to better our the lives of our clients. And why is that important? Why is it important that we use our voice for that um, purpose? We are, we have agency, right? We know that as social workers, we sometimes have more power to speak up in these spaces, right? And we're supposed to advocate for social, social justice, right? So that is part, part of it. So we, this is not the best what the code of ethics says, remain neutral and avoid taking any stance on the policy. Why, why should we just remain neutral knowing that it's going to affect low income population and those that need mental health? We're not advocating for our clients, right? We know better. That's basically what I like to say about that one. Um, why should we only discuss it with other professional social work circles? You could definitely do that, but why would that not be the best ethical action to take? It's not unethical to do C, but that's not going to be the biggest change agent there, right? And it's not giving the community members themselves the voice, the space, the agency to speak up as well. So B is the best. You want to get the public to participate if possible, right? That might require work on our part. We might need to do a grassroots movement. We might be going door to door. Do you know that this policy is being proposed? We'd love for you to come and speak at, you know, city council. Um, and we want their them to participate in the discussions as well. Any questions on this one? And I know that can be a tricky one, right? Because it's like some people you know, like to say, I don't want, I, I just want to remain neutral. Um, but actually, Code of Ethics says it is our obligation to speak up 
for um, social justice and point out and try to um, eliminate any barriers that our clients might face. Okay. Number eight, Alice, a social worker, recently presented at a conference on a new approach to family therapy. The approach was primarily developed by her colleague who had conducted extensive research and formulated the core concepts. Alice had assisted with some case studies and provided feedback, but her role was limited. A publisher attending the conference is impressed and approaches Alice to write a book on the method. What is the most, most ethical action for Alex, Alice to take in this situation? Before we read the answer choices, where in the code of ethics does this fall? This is an ethical question, but what do we know ethically? Like, it doesn't feel like it might necessarily be spot on with uh, the code of ethics, but there is something in the code of ethics that we need to consider here. And this is one of those little tiny sections in the code of ethics that has like one or two sentences. And it does, it comes under um, responsibility to client, to, to colleagues. And what it is, is it's, I'll, I'll go through the answer choices, but it is have to do, having to do with relationships with colleagues. So what should, what would be the most ethical action? A, Alice should mention her colleague in the acknowledgement section if she chooses to write a book. B, decline the offer, offer explaining that her colleague is the main developer of the approach and suggesting his name for authorship. C, if she chooses to write a book, her colleague should be given a portion of the sales. Or D, if she chooses to write the book, she should only include the case studies in which she participated in. Ethically speaking, you know, we have a responsibility to our colleagues. What makes the most sense and why? What makes the most sense and why? I remember here it says, what's the most ethical action? And with ethics, it's I, I've done a lot of ethics training. We often learn you either do this or you don't do that, but there's so much gray area in between, right? That's why we have to do ethical decision making. And it's always, it's not always black, black and white. There might be some gray area too. So why, what would be the most ethical action and why? So as part of that, um, duty we have to our colleagues, it says that we should not, as clinicians, practitioners, academics, take credit for work that is not ours, right? So we do not take credit for work that's not ours. Why Why do you think we should not, I mean, it makes sense, but from an ethical perspective, why should we not take credit where, for something that we did not do? Plagiarism, absolutely. Conflict, especially here when we get into like, if you're writing a book, there's going to be financial part that goes into it too. So it would basically be benefiting from someone else's work. That's not ethical, right? So knowing that, um, let's see, what would we go ahead? What would you rule out first? What would be your first eliminated? Mentioning the colleague in the acknowledgements, acknowledgements would not go far enough at all, right? Like, no. Imagine if you did all this research and then someone wrote a book and put a little line, thank you to so-and-so for your contributions. No, that would not be ethical. That's not, you know, giving credit where credit is due. A is out. Um, if she chooses to write a book, her colleague should be given a portion of the sales. Also, that still is having her take credit for something that she didn't really um, design herself or it was not her research that shaped this, right? That would be great if she did give the colleague a portion of the sales, but it's still not the best ethical decision. And then only if she chooses to write the book, only including the case studies in which she participated, that's a little bit better, but what's wrong with D? It's not the worst of the options, but what's wrong with only writing about the case studies that she worked on? It still leaves out the colleague, right? Um, she had a limited role, so she is not, and really what this comes down to is she is not an expert on this approach to be able to um, report on it, write on it, that type of thing. 
Um, so the correct answer would be to decline the offer, explain that her colleague's the main developer of the approach and su su suggest his name. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I will tell you, this is the best case scenario. I am sure that this happens. People taking people's academic um, property, that type of thing, trying to sell it. So it's really, really, really important that you don't take credit where credit, you don't have the credit because there is legal ramifications, right? This person could sue her. There's like so many things that we need to consider as well. So you want to be really careful with this type of stuff. Okay. Now we have a LGBTQ question. Number nine, a social worker meets with a new client, Jamie, who identifies as a gender. Jamie expresses discomfort with gendered terms and shares experiences of feeling misunderstood in previous therapeutic settings. In order to provide culturally competent and affirming care for Jamie, what is the most appropriate action for the social worker to take? Mm -hmm. A, use gender, gender neutral pronouns with Jamie. B, ask Jamie about their preferred pronouns and how they understand their A gender identity. C, refer Jamie to an LGBTQ plus specialist for more targeted support. Or D, encourage Jamie to explore her gender identity in therapy. What would you pick and why? And um, this is a term that you may or may not be familiar with. If you are familiar with this term, what, is it, what does A gender mean? It's not to be confused with non-binary. Similar, but different. And this has to do with gender, not sexuality. So it's also not asexuality either. So I'll give you a few more minutes of this. And this is where those concepts can be a little bit tricky sometimes. Okay, so what a gender means is not feeling that you have a specific gender. So it's not that I don't feel that there's a gender that fits. It's more that I don't, I don't see myself as either gender type of situation here. And I'm trying to find if I can find an example. Um, so here they they might not want to be gendered in any sort of way. So the concept of gender is not something that they feel fits their gender identity. Um, so what do we do here to be affirming and culturally competent? So what do we think? What is your answer choice and why? Why are you choosing what you did? Okay, so what do we do here? D is not correct, why? Why are we not gonna say, you know what? I'd love for you to explore this more in therapy. Is that affirming to be like, you know what? You should explore this more and tell the client what the, to do. No, we already know the client had issues with previous providers and did not feel that the person was um, affirming and um, understanding. Okay. Um, do you think this client at this point needs a LGBTQ specialist? No, anyone can be, um, you know, affirming in care and you should be affirming. And now people are getting a little, I see some for A, some for B. Um, do we know that Jamie wants to use gender neutral pronouns? No, we don't assume that, right? Like, um, that's not a, a bad answer. That's better than picking a gender and you, doing it incorrectly, which could cause more harm. But the best thing would be to ask about preferred pronouns because Jamie might just want to go by Jamie. Um, they, they might want to go by they, them. We don't know. So we ask about their preferred pronouns and how they understand their identity. And I think sometimes as clinicians, we get uncomfortable with asking. We don't want to offend the, offend the client, but we are actually offending them by not clarifying and not asking. It is 
totally okay to show curiosity and make sure that you are asking up front so that you don't run into any situations where you are misgendering or um, causing some sort of harm to the therapeutic relationship. Any questions about this? Someone said their job says that they should not ask. And you might have agency, depending on, you have to know this too, depending on where you are in the United States, we know that there's some definitely anti-LGBTQ legislation out there. We always go by code of ethics for the test though. So it is not um, setting specific code of ethics um, is national. Any questions on this one? This can be this can be a little bit tricky for um because it, it can be an uncomfortable conversation. Okay. Um last one, number 10. Any questions about number nine? How many of you have heard of the term agender? It's um definitely not one of the more common terms in the LGBTQ um plus space, but it's important that you know it because there have been people on this exam that say they were not prepared for these questions. So um, definitely check it out. Okay. If you are looking for more ASWB study content, like I said at the beginning of the video, check us out at agentsofchangeprep.com. If you have any questions, you may email us at agentsofchangeprep at gmail.com. And as always, we wanna thank you for tuning in. And remember this test is hard, but you can do hard things. You got this and I commend you on taking this next step in your studying journey. Thank you.